I'm always afraid I'll spill, so I bring a dog. Um, first of all, thanks to all the Lone Star guys. It's a delight to be here. I hope, I'm really looking forward to the rest of the conference, and I appreciate being browbeat into coming. I'm here this morning to tell your future. But before I can do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about your past, or at least the past of some of you. If you're of European descent like me, this will be your story. If you're from further east, from China or Korea or Japan, it's a little different. If you're from anywhere in the Americas, it'll be different still. But the stories all do, like all stories, converge at some point. So uh, regardless of whether it's yours or not, I think you'll enjoy it. It starts out with scrolls. Scrolls were first invented perhaps 7,000 years ago, and they certainly, invented in each, they certainly existed in ancient Egypt by 3000 BCE. Now BCE is uh, modern for uh, BC, and I just find that all too confusing, so from now on I'm just gonna use negative numbers. <laughs> so we had scrolls in ancient Egypt by minus 3000, and, and the way people wrote them is it's ink or paint using reeds or rolled up metal tubes on papyrus, which is a plant found along the River Nile. So they would uh, get long strips of papyrus, they would beat them together, they'd wet them out, they'd beat them together, they'd make a long piece of paper, and they would write on it. This scroll has several qualities. It's uh, sequential access. If you break any part of it, you have to replace the whole thing. It's very hard to put a bookmark in it. They're hard to store get piles when they fall off the desk, right? They made little cubby holes. There's a, there's a lot of ways in which this is hard. If you look at the writing on it, you'll see that uh, there's not much in the way of punctuation or spaces between words. But it, it was kind of okay because there weren't very many people who could write and there weren't very many people who could read and they all sort of had a bargain about what this meant. There was some pattern that they agreed upon. And scrolls were the latest, the very latest in technology, up right until the, right around the year zero. And at that point, the Romans got involved. And they invented something that they called a codex. And a codex is just a book. That's all it is. And here's a picture. This is a wall painting from Pompeii, which we know to have existed in the year 79. And that is, of course, 0079. And a codex is just a, it's a book. It's got pages that are all the same size. They're bound together along one edge. They're random access. You can replace any part that breaks. It's easy to put a bookmark in and remember a thing. This code, oh, and they also allow, there's one more quality they allow, that you can read and write at the same time, which you cannot do with a scroll because it takes two hands to read a scroll. This codex is pieces of wood covered in wax, and there's a little stylus that you use to scrape on it. So it's kind of a temporary book. It's meant for temporary records. Starting around the time of the Romans, books begin to be created by monks in monasteries in rooms called scriptoriums. And the scriptorium is kind of a co-working space for writing. In, a, in the monastery, the scriptorium was usually right next to the library. And all of the materials that they used, all, all the books in the library and all the materials they used in the scriptorium are incredibly flammable. So it's like a co-working space where the heat is never on. And monks would occasionally, like, you know how when you work for a really conservative organization, you're always trying to sneak something subversive into the comments of your code? The monks would write, make little notes in the margins. They would complain it was too cold or that their hands were cramping. There's a lot of old sheets of paper where monks have wine in them. This, oh, sorry. This is a picture from 692 that was commissioned in 692. You can see it must be summer because this man is barefoot. He's barefoot. No shoes on. So monks, being religious people, wrote about religious things. And so mostly what they wrote was Bibles and texts for religious services. And here's an example. This is in Latin. It's a Psalter which means it's a page from the Book of Psalms, the biblical, the biblical Book of Psalms. It's from around 1300. And now you can see lots of advances in writing. There's a clear punctuation. There's spaces between the words. There's an obvious font. This font actually has a name. It's Gothic Liturgical Hand. And there's also a more ornate letter that starts, that begins every sentence in every paragraph. So this document was written by Quill on parchment. Quills came, people started using quills around 600. And the very best quill for a right-handed writer came from the left primary wing feather of a goose. Now, a big book like the Bible takes about five years to write, and a quill lasts about a week. You're going to need a lot of geese. <laughs> 
And parchment is made from the skin of sheep. And a big book like the Bible is going to take hundreds of sheep. So yeah, you get it. You're going to need a lot of sheep. And really high quality parchment is uh, called vellum, V-E-L-L-U-M. It's made from, well, it's actually really, it's beautiful to work with. Everyone loves it. It's supple and fine. It's really easy to manage and write on. And it's made from the skin of baby sheep. And the pictures all broke my heart. So there will be no illustration of that. <laughs> Here's another example. This is an antiphonal. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. Antiphonal? I don't know. It's basically 13th century sheet music. And, and here you can see one of the things that these manuscripts, one thing that was common on almost all these manuscripts was something they called illumination. Like part of writing, it wasn't just writing the thing down, it was these beautiful illustrations. It was considered sort of a meditation for the monks when they sat in the scriptorium and wrote things down. And so it was a very big part of what they did to make things beautiful. And so from their start in the year zero, over the next 600 or so years, codexes gradually replaced scrolls. And by the 1400, books are written on parchment by hand using quills. And by 1407, monks were doing things like this. This is a lectern Bible. It's in a monastery in England. Um, it is sort of the, the uh, apex of this craft. It's beautifully written. You can see it's justified, and you can tell it, it was somebody's job to put uh, like guidelines in the book. So they would go through page after page of vellum, put the guidelines, so that when the monks sat down and wrote it, it would be beautifully organized. So this is from 1407. But just 40 odd years later, by around 1450, there's a dramatic change. And at that time in Europe, in 1450, there were a number of objects that were common enough to be around under everyone's eye. And one of them is the wine press. And this is a stylized version done in a mosaic. You can see how a wine press works is there's a handle at the top, and this big thing is a screw. And attached to the bottom of the screw, there's a lid that fits inside this barrel. So you can screw it all the way up, fill the barrel with grapes, and then screw it down and press the wine out of the grapes. Now this is perhaps less romantic, but certainly more efficient than using your feet. We also had coins. There are coins in common circulation everywhere. These are Roman coins from 75 to 79. But, so to make a coin, what you need is a die. And a die is the any of the coin. You need, actually need two dies. You need one for the front of the coin and one for the back. And if you have two dies that are carved, you can take uh, coin blanks and heat them up to make them soft and make a little sandwich, die, coin, die, and whack it with a hammer. And now you have a coin. And now a coin only gets hit once, so it lasts a long time, but the dies get beat on over and over again. So the dies wear out very quickly. Uh, it's important that all your coins look alike. And so when your dies are out and you need to make new dies, it's very hard to get an exact, re uh, exact duplicate of the die you had. And so they back up one and develop a process for making dies. You make dies from a thing called a punch. And a punch is a tube of metal that's carved one face of the coin. So you have like rods of metal. One's the front, one's the back of the coin. You can turn the rod over and punch out a die. You can use the dies till they wear out, and at which time you can make new dies from the punch that's only been used once. And in that way, you can make a whole bunch of coins that look just alike. Um, and also around this time, in, in 1450, something arrives in Europe that's been around in China for a long time, but it's, it's a relatively recent uh, arrival in Europe, and that's paper. Relative to parchment, paper, uh, paper's fragile, it's weak, you can't erase it very much, it's not very durable, but you can make it from rags and hemp and old plant fibers, so, and it's expensive, but it's not as expensive as sheep. <laughs> and so in the 1430s in Mance, Germany, all of these things were, were under the eye of this man, Johannes Gutenberg. He was a blacksmith, a goldsmith, and ultimately the inventor of the modern printing press. He combines these things into a grand idea which he calls an automatic writing machine. And he's obsessed with this machine. Building it takes the rest of his life. It leaves him in serious legal trouble. It drives him into bankruptcy. It makes other people rich, and it changes the world. It took him many years to make it work. He wanted to print books, but of course, like every technician, at first he had to spend a number of years shaving yaks. And the biggest yak he had to shave involved this. This is called a sort. And you can see that it looks like a coin punch. It has a raised edge on one end, and if you put ink on that edge and turn it around, you can see it will faithfully reproduce that image on a sheet of paper. But it's way trickier than a coin punch because it has uh, little notches, little bits down the body of the shaft. Um, you need a lot of sorts. 
You need every letter and every font and every size you're going to need for however many pages you're going to set, and they wear out quickly. And when you make new ones, it's not just the face that you need, you need the shape along the shaft. And so the printing process is not going to work until Gutenberg uh, develops a reliable way to duplicate sort. And it takes him many years to do that, and he borrows money the whole time. And he ends up doing this. The thing on the left, a, a craftsman would carve in a soft piece of wood a, the Audi, which is going to be the punch. And then they would temper that piece of metal and make it hard. And then they turn it upside down, and they, they bang it into another piece of metal and make the any of it, which is going to be the matrix. Now, this is just the end of a sort, and we have to get that stuff along the shaft. In order to do that, he invents this machine. All right, I've been looking at this for weeks, and I still don't quite get it, so don't even try. But what I can tell you is that the thing on the left, these two are the exploded view of this piece. These two are assembled over here. The matrix slides in the bottom with the hollow part up, and they pour molten lead in this hole in the top. And all of this stuff on the inside, whatever that is, makes the little notches and things. So you can imagine in 1450, this was not an easy device to invent, and it took a really long time to get it right. But once he has it, once he can make sorts, he creates this machine. You can see the wine press, and you can tell if you assemble a whole bunch of sorts in a form, you can, lay, you can roll ink on that and put a sheet of paper in there, and then you can do this. There you go, you can print one side of one page of a book. One day we were hand copying print, and on the next we had the printing press. Now Gutenberg printed a number, he, along the way he printed like small things, like little, like those indulgences, that stuff you can buy to make your sins go away. He did that, and little calendars. And then he printed uh, between 160 and 185 Bibles. About a quarter of them were vellum, and the rest were paper. This Bible is 1,300 pages long, and it was completed sometime between March and November of 1455, right before Gutenberg went bankrupt and lost the rights to his printing press. And so he disappears from this story now, but the printing press lived on. It dramatically speeds up printing, and all kinds of new works begin to be written. And the primary cost of printing is now in the setting of type. Before you can print a page, you have to collect all the type you need and every letter of every font of every size, and you have to assemble them on the page by hand. This is an artisanal shop, a modern shop that still does this, and it takes a lot of type. And over the next 400 years, some patterns emerge in print shops. They don't need as many of that special form of letter that starts sentences and paragraphs, and so they kept those in the upper cases. They needed many more of all those other smaller forms of the letter in the same font, and they kept them in the lower cases. And it became a pattern that you could go to any print shop in Europe and tell people, go get me the uppercase E, and they would know exactly the letter you meant. When laying out a book, you had to balance the cost of setting up the type between how many pages you expected to print and how much type you had. You, don't, you usually don't have enough type to set everything in a whole book at once, all the pages, and leave that type lying around. So you would have to decide in advance. You'd have to do some kind of market research and figure out how many copies of the book you expected to sell. And you would iterate through the book, laying out type, printing a number of pages, breaking the type down, setting the type again. It wasn't uncommon at some point while you were laying out type to find that you didn't have enough letters to lay out all the pages you expected to have. You would have run out of sorts, which usually indeed put them out of sorts. And the problem with having to reset something that, because you unexpectedly needed to print more copies was, un, was solved in 1725 by a guy named William Ged. He, made, he, made, he developed a process where he would make paper mache impressions of a form of type. And then he would use that paper mache impression to cast a solid metal sheet that looked like the type it came from. These stereotypes were used to reprint something after you'd broken the type down. Stereotyping was not free. It had costs then as now. And it was the exception rather than the rule. In, in 1850, the, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote The Scarlet Letter. And his publishers, he was already a famous author, so his publishers decided it was going to be a success, and they did an enormous first print run. They printed two and a half thousand copies. And the, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on who you are, that, that print run sold out in two months. And so they had to reset all the type again. And this time they printed 3,500 copies. 
And that print run sold out in four months, at which time they reset all the type again, and finally decided it would make sense to stereotype the book at that point. So in the printing world, this is indeed where we get our word stereotype. It's, it became a metaphor for a set of ideas that were repeated identically as a whole with minor changes. So the printing press, with the advent of the printing press, the number of books printed in Europe absolutely exploded. Now notice this chart. This chart is logarithmic. It starts out, the bottom number here in the 6th century is 10,000. That number is a billion. That, and, in every page of every book that was printed, every page of every book that was printed had movable type in it that was set by hand. In newspapers, they print a new book every day. Newspapers have to set up type and break down type every day for the content that they're going to print. And by the middle of the 19th century, there was no newspaper in the world that was longer than eight pages. So by the 1870s, many people were working on this problem. They were trying to automate the setting of type. And by 1884, after eight years of work, this man, Otmar Mergenthaler, has solved it. He's a watchmaker's apprentice, came from Germany, moved to Washington, D.C., and then to Baltimore. And he invents a machine that revolves around something he just simply calls a matrix. Now this matrix, when you look at it, you can see it, there's an inset of the letter W and it has all these little teeth up at the top. This looks a lot like Gutenberg's matrix. And you can imagine if you had a bunch of these matrix and you stacked them side by side, you could pour hot lead into that space and cast sorts on the fly. If you have molten lead, you can dynamically produce a line of type. And so now you still need a lot of mat. They also call matrices mats. And you need a lot of mats. You still need a lot of mats. But you don't need nearly as many mats as you need uh, sorts, because you can reuse the mats to make source uh, on the fly. And so that's, that, that mat is a central piece of this machine. OK, so the machine has, I'm just going to take you through the parts. It has a keyboard. And there's a place up here they call magazine. Uh, mats live in the magazine. There's a, the mold mill over here, which has a little thing on it. There's a thing called the melting pot back here. And at the top, there's the distributor. So I'm going to just do a blow up of this part. Here's a mat falling down out of that magazine into the stack right here. And you can see these are the edges where the matrices of uh, the, the inset letter on the matrices are all sitting there. Once you do that, once you assemble a line of matrices, the spaces aren't actually uh, matrices. They're these shims. And they're fatter at the bottom than they are at the top. You can imagine if you had a line of type that looked like that and you pushed up on it with perhaps bar number five, that would spread the line of type out and, until it reached the stops at the edge, and that would justify a line of text. Once you've done that, you could take that line of type and stick it on the mold wheel. Where it would be hooked to this machine, the piston goes down, and molten lead, I kid you not, goes up this chute and into that little space, and that's what creates a line of type. And now you need to get the matrix back where it came from so you can use it again. It has all these little teeth on it. Now you notice that some of them aren't really teeth. There are spaces where the teeth are cut off. This is a binary code. And so the mat carries back up to the top of the machine, and it gets put on this rod that has grooves on it. And there's a screw here that moves the mat along the rod. There's eventually you reach a place where the grooves are missing, where the mat has teeth, and then it falls off in the slot where it came from. Believe it or don't, I have a demo. Let's now review the entire procedure at a glance. The manipulation of the keys releases the mat from in the magazine. They drop between the assembly entrance partitions and are delivered to assembling elevator to form the line. The finished line is sent on to the caster. The mold and the metal pot advance and the plunger makes the cap. The pot and the mold withdraw. Then the first elevator rises to transfer the mat to the second elevator bar. At the same time, the slug trimmed at the base and side is ejected into the galley. The mats go to the distributor. Moved by the helicoidal screws, they run along the length of the distributor bars so that, with the procedure already noted, 
they fall into the respective channels of the magazine, ready for use in succeeding lines. Thomas Edison called the linotype machine the eighth wonder of the world. Book publishers and newspapers bought linotype machines as fast as they could get their hands on them. The average size of a newspaper went from eight to 48 pages practically overnight. There was an explosion of printed material. Suddenly we were setting um, type in lines per minute instead of minutes per line. This is, this is a composing room of the New York Times in 1942, and this is the Dallas Morning News. This, is a room, this room is a workplace safety nightmare. <laughs> There's hot lead. This machine will not stop moving. It's incredibly noisy. This is one of the few jobs in America where they actively recruit deaf people. It's better if you already have a hearing loss. <laughs> Line type operating isn't, operation isn't easy. It takes a lot of practice to get good at it, and there, there are many, many ways to get hurt. It was an art, and it was taught by artists, one to another. And the folks who practiced it were proud of their craft. Here's a man, this is also at the Dallas Morning News. He's running manual spell check. <laughs> so once all that type gets printed, once a column of newspaper type gets created, the type goes out in these little trays to what they call the makeup men. And here's a, here's a guy setting, laying out the sports page. Now you notice that he is laying out this page upside down and backwards. And he can, they can all read type that way. They all learn to read upside down and backwards because that's what they deal with every day, all day long. Once a page of type gets set, it, has, it needs to be really level across the top so it can be printed. It's a little hard to see. They run this block around and then they hammer it with that mallet. So this is like manual leveling of type. This way of, this way of uh, the line of type machine is far faster than hand setting movable type. But it, looking at what I've just showed you makes it seem too easy. And I also have a demo of this. It's still very labor intensive. The uh, headlines especially, that type's too big. It can't be set with a line of type machine. You're still doing that by hand. And then they have to go and they have to put everything where it goes, everywhere. They have to put the pictures around it. It's possible you can drop a piece. And it's a serious, serious pain to fix a type. You can never complain about CSS again. <laughs> so the line of type machine is responsible for an explosion of content and a new kind of transparency of information. It makes it possible for newspapers to print anything they can find out every day. It boosts the production of books and magazines the price of education goes down and literacy skyrockets. Print becomes affordable and ubiquitous. And by 1928, this was the primary typesetting device in the world. Information is power, and the linotype made it available to everyone. But as with all arcs of technology, the linotype's reign ended even more suddenly than it began. In the mid-1960s, it was replaced by the computer. And I remember when this happened. I grew up in Parkersburg, West Virginia, and my father worked for the Daily Paper, the News and Sentinel. He was officially a member of the Printers Union, and he could, at need, operate a linotype machine, but he was actually a mechanic. And he kept the, the dirty, noisy, dangerous presses and linotype machines running. No matter what disaster occurred, they put a paper out every day. Some days it wasn't very big. But they took this deadline very seriously. When the daily paper was the only internet that was, they never let it go down. My dad wore black clothes to work because no amount of washing could make anything else look clean. And his hands were nicked and stained, marked by grease and ink. It was honest work, but there was no amount of washing would get his hands clean. In my childhood in the 1960s, he would sometimes come home with brass mats in his pockets. But by then, by the 60s, this era of hot type is ending. It's being replaced by cold type, by computers. You study electronics in a little room in our basement and became the mechanic for a new kind of composing machine, one that was quiet and clean and which had a cathode ray tube where you could actually see what you were typing without casting a hunk of lead. As a kid, I noticed this because I was fascinated by his oscilloscope and because 
He was gone during the evenings for nearly a year while he studied in the basement. And because afterwards he gradually replaced his black work outfits with clothes in tan and gray and green. And a day came when his hands were pink and clean. He swam across this transition from hot to cold type, and he spent many more years in the newspaper business, though has, as had been true for many monks and hand setters of movable type and then linotype operators, many of his colleagues did not. And now, finally, Against the backdrop of 5,000 years of the creation of content and the control of information, it's time for your fortune. And I want you to brace yourself, because this is the unvarnished truth, and some of this is hard. Everything will change. Everything. You will die. And everyone you know will die. Your grandparents, your parents, all of them. Some will die in quiet peace after a long life well lived, but others will not be so lucky, and their end will come in confusion and pain and with regrets. Others will die too soon of accident or terrible disease or by their own hands, and they will leave you alone in grief and anger and guilt. Regardless of how they go, you will see them pass and the as the generations in front of you disappear one by one, you will feel yourself in their footsteps, taking that big step forward in the mortality line. I know this to be your future because it is my past. These things will come to be. Next, your body will fail you. Your eyes will weaken. You'll be unable to read street signs in unfamiliar neighborhoods at night or menus in dimly lit restaurants. You'll become increasingly grateful for and dependent upon your GPS and that little flashlight in your cell phone. You will have surgery on one or more joints and get on far too good a terms with your orthopedic surgeon. You will develop low back trouble and a repetitive motion injury. Days of sitting in a chair, frozen in a keyboard, typing, 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 they'll accumulate and like drips from a cave ceiling, turn parts of you into stalagmites and stalactites. Yes, all of this has happened to me. Not only will your family and your body change, but your work will change. I got my first programming job in March of 1978, three short months before the New York Times last set a newspaper with a line of type machine. The first web browser, Mosaic, appeared 15 years later, and it was two and a half years after that, on December 21st of 1995, when Ruby 0.95 was released. And now, a mere 20 years after that first browser, the internet is at the center of our lives. We live inside this bubble, so it's hard to remember, but the job you hold today appeared as suddenly as that as a linotype operator. In the 60s and 70s, when photo typesetting arrived, this machine became obsolete, worthless, almost overnight. Newspapers disposed of them by throwing them out of upper story windows into parking lots and having them hauled off for scrap. So, there you go, that's your future. Not <laughs> death, decay, and obsolescence. It's like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I admit, I admit, it sounds bad, I know. But in the arc of your life, this is the happy path. These are the things you can depend upon. They're the abstraction, the meta layer that stands above all of the daily change. If your life really were an application, you wouldn't ignore the inevitable. You'd get on this. You'd be working on these features right now. Accepting the truth of this fortune makes it clear what's important. The MVPs of the only app that matters are health, happiness, and the world we leave our children. And I want you to start working on this app right now. And there's some more hanging fruit here. And I'm going to take advantage of my uh, age and my position on the stage to give you advice. Why not? That's why they got me. Happiness. Live as if you know you'll die. Do real things. Tell them you love them today. You might consider getting a little dog. <laughs> health, health.
yourself. Okay, I'm not asking you to do anything dangerous. But do something. It's a rear guard action. Believe me, I know this. But go down fighting. Take care of yourself. Get an ergonomic keyboard. Stand up some while you work. Exercise. Take some walks. Go to the gym. Get a bike if you're interested in that. You cannot make up tomorrow for not working out today. And trust me, you are going to want your body later. So there are parts of this app that you can work on by yourself, but there's some parts of it are more suited for us to work on together. Our community is important, and your place in it matters. You don't have to be on the Rails core team to make an important contribution. Showing up in small ways can make a big difference. And I'm just going to skip, like we all know you can contribute to open source projects. That's a given, right? But you can also, if you want, you can teach. Teaching, teaching is a way to, to get just a little bit taller but catch um, cast a much longer shadow. I've been, uh, Katrina Owen has a new website, exorcism.io, and I've been loving it. It's a place where you can do little exercises and then comment on other people's code so that you can sort of converge on an understanding of a better solution. Uh, if you want to teach but you're a terrible at organization like I am, it, it, this is not a problem because other people have already done all the organizing. You can go to Railsbridge or Rails Girls. Um, I have a policy about Rails Girls. I never say it without following it with love the mission, hate the name. <laughs> Rails Bridge, Rails Girls, you can go, you can show up and teach. And you don't have to be an expert, you can be someone that took that class last week. In some ways, uh, people, people who are closer to the students are better, actually better instructors. There's a Rails uh, Bridge in Charlotte, North Carolina next week. I'll be there. There's a Rails, sorry, Girls in Houston next week. Feel no pressure. We can do things for ourselves, and we can do things for our tech community, but we are also uniquely qualified to do things for others. We're bigger than Rails, and we're bigger than Ruby. We're members of a tribe, the tribe of information, and our lineage is scribes and typesetters and linotype operators. From scrolls to codexes, scriptoriums to composing machines, we carry the mantle of the open sourcing of information. And I feel doubly a member of this tribe. Not only do I do this work, but I was raised by a man who came home with mats in his pockets and ink in his hands. My dad is now 80, and he happily works four days a week. Two of them at, two of them at Enterprise Rental Car. Yes, he's the man who picks you up. <laughs> and the other two he volunteers at the local food bank. He does books and he mows the lawn, and he finds temporary loans for people who can't keep the electricity on, and he tries to make sure that people don't go hungry. Despite his efforts, they do. I will not presume to say that you have an obligation to something greater than yourself, but he feels one, and I inherited that feeling from him. Your schools need help. Your neighborhoods need help. If you want, you can pitch in literally. This is a habitat built here in Austin. Um, as a, I can sweeten this pot by telling you, once at a Habitat build, they let me drive the bobcat. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're not the nail banging, sheet rock hanging type, I can tell you from personal experience that their volunteer management software sucks. And I actually, I'll make a sweeping generalization, a stereotype, if you will. I contend to you that every organization like Habitat, the volunteer management software for all of the software, for all of those organizations, sucks. If we didn't write it, it sucks. <laughs> Everywhere I look, there's something that needs doing. And I can promise you, there's deep satisfaction in stepping up and doing it. It's an axiom among cyclists that either there's a headwind or you're having a good day. <laughs> and I'm always tempted to claim a fast wind-assisted ride as my own accomplishment as if I really am that strong and did it all myself. But I can't forget that if my doppelganger, doppelganger, little Sandy me, was out on the same day at the same time in the same conditions but riding in the opposite direction, that she would work just as strong, she would work just as hard but accomplish far less. We are here because we have done the work. I know that. We got into this tribe by dint of our own efforts and because of our care for our craft. But we have also been blown here by the twin tailwinds of chance and change. 
We deserve our successes, no doubt. We've earned them. But there is a way in which we all got here because we are lucky enough to have the wind at our backs. Having looked at the past, we can predict the future. Change. And by an accident of timing, we stand at the vortex of this change, at the intersection of information and technology. Unlike many others, we are lucky enough to have choices. And the things we choose now will create the world everyone sees next. I urge you, choose something big. Thank you. Confess, I don't know if you're a drinker or not. Oh, I <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but Bullet Bourbon is the official drink of Lone Star Ruby Conference. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Is there some questions? Yes. Anybody have questions for Sandy? Um, flag me down. I've got the mic. I spent uh, six months reading about the history of the printing press, so anything you want to know about that? <laughs> Got a lot of data that wouldn't fit on the slides. <laughs> Any questions more? at all? This is your chance. I've stunned you, haven't I? Oh, I got one. Probably one of the worst questions I ask as far as programming stuff, but... Um, I was uh, infected with the ability to notice kerning, and I was going to ask you, kerning. Yeah, where did that come from? Oh, you know what? Okay, you asked me like the, I'm sure there are a million questions I can't answer, but I, I really can't answer that. But I'll I'll use it as an excuse to tell you a little bit about fonts. Like the line type company is out of business now. When the um, when people were carving handset type, there weren't all that many fonts. But when the line type machine came in business, uh, it, you know they could make money off mats. And so, and it was easy to make mats. And so there are enormous font books and the, uh, talk about, like, like we know that our current uh, layout people are, are obsessive about fonts and about layout. And those, those people were just absolutely <coughs> berserk about getting fonts perfect. And there's books and books and books. Like many of the type faces that we use today were invented by the Linotype Corporation. And I didn't, I didn't make a long list of them because I wouldn't fit on slides, but. It, it is true. Almost everything we know about how to lay out type came from those guys. Um, when the line type machine went bust, there's like that com the hardware side of that company went away, and now all they do is software. If you Google them, they're still out there, but what they're doing is making and selling fonts. Hey, Sandy, over here. Well, that's really Wait, loud. Wave around. Who is oh, over <laughs> there. Thank right you. Hey. Uh, love your talk. Um, I was wondering if you have any other uh, favorite online resources that are kind of hubs for opportunities, volunteer uh, you know, for I'm, our specific skill set? I'm the worst at that. Um, I, like, I, like, I want to urge you to go outside of our network and do real things for real people, things that your uh, non-technical peers might use. So I'm, I'm really um, interested in this. The, there's a guy working on software for the farmer's market in Durham where I live that whole thing about, like, there's a hole in my road or, there's a ton of uh, freely available data at the government, and I, I'm a believer that transparency may, will make us understand that we govern ourselves. And any way that would put uh, visualizations over top of massive, as, na massive sets of data that our taxpayers, our tax dollars have collected, that show us how we're doing with that self-governing process, I think those are really worthwhile causes. So I want you to make new ones, I think is what I'm saying. Uh, Sun Sunshine, what is it, Sunshine Labs, that does the... Sunlight Foundation. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, the Sunlight Foundation is a good place to start if you're looking for stuff like that. I have a quick question about the uh, machine with all the lead. How did they avoid poisoning? Um, my dad, they didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did he use those composing rooms? People don't even have ear protection on. Like, my father wore, I, I, like, I do a little bit of stained glass that has lead cane. And if you go to a stained glass store and buy lead cane, they tell you, use gloves, wash your hands, don't touch this. And these people worked it in like lines of molten lead all day long. My dad has had a couple of the kinds of cancers you get from repeated exposure to those chemicals, and he has survived them all. But I suspect mostly it just eventually killed those people. I mean, it was really seriously. 
Like, I've been in a composing room when I was a little kid, and they're, they're deafening. The, the presses are next door. And so it's just, it's not safe. They didn't avoid it, is the answer to that question. Like, people were considered that's more disposable than the product they produced. Josh. Yeah. I'll just repeat the question. Okay, here. Yes. Hi, Sandy. This is Holly from uh -huh. Maker Square. Thanks for helping yesterday with the offers. We really appreciated it. I have a question. Um, I'm getting into the development world, and as a female, I wanted to ask you, you're a family woman, mm -hmm. so how do you balance with your life app, you know, working in this industry and, you know, balancing your life and relationships and everything? You just decide. Like, the, the pressures of the world will eat you alive. And you have to choose not to, you have to be choose by driven, to be driven by your own desires and motivations and not to do what they want from you or not to give them, give them all of it all the time. It helps if you choose other people who are also committed to that. And so you can make a tribe of your own that insists on common sense and the right kind of, and a balanced life, a real life. And I, I hope that I am living proof that you can succeed doing that. I think many people in here could serve as role models. So, you know, avoid them. Don't do it, all right? Stand strong. Let me, let me say this to you. You are right to want that. Let me validate that for you. It is insane to give up your life for this business. You are gonna die someday. And the older you get, the, more, the older you get, the more you'll regret those lost years. 80 hours a week is just gone. And you're gonna wish you'd gotten that little dog. Right? So do it. Like, hold, it, it's easy to, uh, we're wired as humans to discount the, the future for the present. Like to think, oh, I'll get to that later and I'll just be, I'll give it up now because I can have it later. There's an interesting technique I've read recently to avoid that thought and it's, it's this. Every day you get up and instead of saying, I will take time off tomorrow, make this bargain with yourself in the morning. Whatever I do today, I have to do the same thing every day forever. Every future day will not be different. It will be just like today. So if you live today as if it's the only day you have, then it changes your perspective. And believe me, it is. Hey, hey Sandy, that, that was just an amazing talk. So thank you. Um, so first question is, do you need help with that bottle? Uh, <laughs> we can talk. Okay. We can talk. Um, so in, your, in the history of type, just amazing. I used to do a little work in publishing and I didn't know half of that. So that was just really good research. And I'm, I'm curious, in your research, I'm, so the, the printing process and all the stuff you talked about, monks and Bibles, clear that religion was a big uh, power influence behind the development of the information technology. Mm -hmm. Governments were probably involved in there somewhere. I'm, I'm curious, you know, we see a lot of um, stuff being uncovered now about the role of government in, in, in the information technology that we all work with. Uh -huh. And I'm curious how, how like the role of government and powerful structures interacted with all this technology development. You know, there wasn't all that much in the way of government. In some ways, the church was the government in the, before the year 1000. But there's a, that's a, thank you, I did not plant this. There was a part I had to take out of the talk because I didn't have time to tell you. And it's the, around about the year 1000, uh, universities. Start, uh, Europe was stable enough so that universities started rising, the, and they, the students needed textbooks, and uh, around universities, bookstores sprang up. And the way a bookstore worked is, you, as a student, you would go and rent the book and take it to a copyist. So you would rent it for a certain time, you'd take it to like the Middle Ages version of Kinko's, and they would make you, they would hand write a copy of that book for you. And so gradually, even though uh, the, I showed you that Bible from 1407, actually by that time, most of uh, book selling and book copying was done in urban centers by commercial businesses. And I think, the, so those urban centers then eventually became states and countries, and the, 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 uh, inf that s spread out more into a government-based thing from that point. All right, thank you, Sandy. If you'll stay on stage just for one more question, um, I'd like for Michael from Cab Forward to come on up. Go ahead and get your computer set up if you have it. Otherwise, we'll just hand you the mic in a sec. We've got time for one more question. Anyone? And we have one hand. Anyone else want to go up against him? We're going to look for a level of enthusiasm. <laughs> Who really wants? Do we have another question? It's one of All right, so it's between the two of you. Who is more enthusiastic about getting this last question? He yielded. 
Thank you. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> Here we go. Can we get you guys to hand this mic back? Thank you very much for your talk. Um, you spoke about our predictions as both people and in some of the software stuff. Would you like to give us a more specific prediction on the life cycle of Ruby that you see in the ecosystem that we exist in? I wouldn't presume to say that the arc of Ruby is ending. I think Ruby's going to be around for a really long time. But I also s suspect that I wrote COBOL programs in the 1970s that are still out there. Like, like we got Ruby because it solved the pro our current problem the best way we could get it solved. And uh, there's a lot of inter interesting things going on right now. So I, I think Ruby will be around for a long time. You're, somebody is going to be writing Ruby code, but I think a lot of us are going to be doing the next thing. One more round of applause for Sandy, please. <laughs>